My Supreme Court case, I'll be presenting on the landmark case of Near vs. Minnesota decided in 1931, which tackled the constitutional question of whether or not censorship, with the intent of suppressing harmful material that could be published and made public of a newspaper, is able to be done under the First Amendment with its free speech clause. Argued on January 30, 1931, and decided on June 1, 1931, Near v. Minnesota involved Jane Near and Howard Guilford, publishers of the newspaper, The Saturday Press, against Floyd Olson and the state of Minnesota, all taking place in, unsurprisingly, Minnesota, specifically Minneapolis. The original event took place in 1921, when Near and Guilford attacked, quote, the police chief, the mayor, a prosecutor, and grand jury members, end quote, and proposed that they were not following their duties of prosecuting criminal activity, even going as far as to associate them with Jewish gangs, all within their newspaper, Floyd Olson, one of these officers, decided to have the Saturday Press permanently stopped for reporting the scandalous content by claiming that it violated the Minnesota public nuisance law. Once this occurred, the two hearings took place at the district court, one with Olson where he received a temporary injunction against Near and Guilford, and another with Near and Guilford where they were required to explain why they should not be permanently enjoined from the ability of publishing their newspaper. This led to Minnesota's Supreme Court where it upheld both of these injunctions that issued from the trial court. Once there, the verdict stated that the scope of the First Amendment did not apply to a case like this. Rather, it was only applicable to media that had been determined to be honest and diligent. Newspapers are able to disturb the public police and inv investigate violence, but the state's police powers can prevent this. The defendants are still able to control another public newspaper that supports public welfare, so the law was decided as constitutional. After this case was decided, it was appealed by Jane Eyre to the U.S. Supreme Court with the help of Robert R. McCormick, the Chicago Tribune's publisher, where it later led to the case of Near v. Minnesota. As Jay Neer in the Saturday Press published his own articles that directly confronted city officials from Minneapolis, Minnesota for not following their duties, he sought to have justice in the situation against Olson and the state of Minnesota for obstructing his freedom of speech and the freedom of the press in this situation. During this case, each side presented their varied reasonings against each other. For Jay Neer, the plaintiff, his arguments were as follows. 1. The free speech and free press position provision of the First Amendment guaranteed in the U.S. Constitution allowed for speech to be given, even if it is negative. 2. The 14th Amendment does not allow for any state to, quote, abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, end quote. This stretches to the Minnesota gag law not possessing the power to deny free speech. And 3. The publishing of the, their articles held the slightest bit of truth against the officers they attacked. Due to the writers' muckraking tendency, the articles tried to be scandalous against them, but were not without their share of stretching the truth, thus demonstrating at least a little amount of it. On the opposition side of the case, the defendant's arguments were as follows. 1. If they intentionally made periodicals to be false, then the public might believe that the newspapers said what they said to be true, thus harming the reputation of the attacked officials in the newspaper. 2. The periodicals contain vulgar terms and malicious content, thus directly violating the Minnesota gag law, known as the public nuisance law. And 3. The ideal of prior restraint is important to protect the innocent public from the lights likes of serious situations including the exposure of military secrets, unwanted slanderous terms, and more. Therefore, it needs to be upheld against the periodicals published in the newspapers. During the case, several previous cases were mentioned in relation to the uh, to the matter at hand, such as Gitlow v. New York discussing the application of the First Amendment to the states, Tyson Bros v. Banton determining how constitutional principles are to be applied as written, Commonwealth v. Blanding involving a similar scandalous paragraph being written about a man named Enoch Fowler, Patterson v. Colorado discussing the use of a primary legal test to decide if speech was able to be criminalized, Schenck v. United States determining if a man, Schenck, and his words were protected under the First Amendment's free speech clause under the Espionage Act, Gompers v. Buckstove and Range Company deciding if the injunction inhibits free speech and press, and finally, Barron v. Baltimore, which involved the Fifth Amendment being decided as inapplicable to state and local government actions. In the end, the Supreme Court vote was a 5-4 decision on June 1st, 1931. The majority was made up by Chief Justice Charles E. Hughes and Justices Oliver Wendell Holmes, Louise Brandeis, Harlan Fisk Stone, and Owen Josephus Roberts. Charles E. Hughes wrote the majority decision, which stated that despite the fact that the contents of the newspaper went against the likes of the public nuisance law, but specifically with the giving away of, quote, a malicious, scandalous, and defamatory newspaper, magazine, or other periodical, end quote, government officials should not be trusted with the ability to regulate speech before it even reaches the public masses. The government is not able to regulate negative speech if there is some element of truth in, in it in some way, and in that instance there must be a case-specific analysis to determine its basis in truth. Prior restraint and government censorship were strictly prohibited in the opinion, although it was mentioned to be applicable in certain situations, such as when the speech is vulgar, instigates violence, or publicly reveals military secrets. However, Hughes does note that the law's general applications influence the decision more so than the specific context of the case.
Meanwhile, the minority was made up of remaining justices Pierce Butler, Willis Van Devanter, James Clark McReynolds, and George Sutherland, with just Justice Pierce Butler writing the dissenting opinion. This stated that the decision of the case ultimately renders every state powerless when restraining the publishing of, quote, malicious, scandalous, and defamatory periodicals, end quote. It allows for an unprecedented freedom to the press and an unprecedented hindrance to the states. The Minnesota Public Nuisance Act was passed out of the state's police powers, and the Saturday press directly violated that. Despite these opposing opinions, there were no concurring opinions written during the case. Nevertheless, the court's ruling stated that under the 14th Amendment's protection of liberty and the First Amendment's freedom of speech, the government does not have authority to prohibit negative speech if there is some essence of truth to it, which must have the truth evaluated in a case-specific analysis in regard to the case brought up. Only certain serious instances could result in the reduction of the freedoms of the press. Through this, Near and Gulford were able to return to the Minneapolis newspaper business. Now, to me, I believe that under the police powers of Minnesota establishing the public nuisance law, the Saturday press's inclusion of malicious content was a direct violation of the law. However, it is guaranteed in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution that no law is able to prohibit the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press. The amendment directly grants the citizens of the U.S. this right and denies any law that abridges that. The 14th Amendment also does not allow for any state to, quote, abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, end quote. As for the lasting impression made by the case, the immediate impact consisted of allowing Near and Gulford to return to the Minneapolis newspaper business as well as having the unprecedented nature of the freedom of the press and the government's undecided ability of prior restraint having action taken on it, deciding that prior restraint was to only be used in certain instances and sparingly. The long-term impact consisted of it becoming one of the main causes regarding the freedom of speech and freedom of the press, as well as the First and Fourteenth Amendment being realized to prevent prior restraint as no laws are able to be formed that prohibit rights guaranteed to citizens in the Constitution. Lastly, this case was considered to be a landmark case for its establishment that prior restraint was a violation of the rights guaranteed in the First Amendment's freedom of speech provision. Furthermore, it helped to establish that the rights in the Bill of Rights stretched to the state governments rather than just the federal government. And just as importantly, the effect of this case had on the freedom of speech has been cited in several other cases, such as Burundian Journalists Union v. Attorney General, State of Kansas v. Nye, Hogan v. Gawker, and Richmond Newspapers v. Virginia Pharmacy. And that concludes my presentation of the landmark case near v. Minnesota and its legacy. Thank you for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your day.